Today we are talking about Jehovah Rapha. Before I do, I want to catch anybody up who may not have been here last week and knows what we're doing. We're in a series called Power in the Name. And this whole summer, what we're going to be doing is going into the Old Testament and looking at stories where God reveals who he is, his character qualities with very specific names. So the name Jehovah, and we're looking at the Jehovah names of God. The name Jehovah is the Latinization of the word Yehoah or Yahweh, meaning I am beginning and end or the one and only God. So this is this massive name, Jehovah or Yahweh, this general name for God. And what I mentioned last week, which I think is important for us to remember this week, is when we're praying to God, it's, it's important for us to know the specifics about his character qualities and who he really is so we can have a specific relationship with a very specific kind of God. Last week, we looked at Jehovah Jireh, which means the one and only God who provides. And today we're looking at Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Rapha means the God or the Lord who heals. And the Hebrew word Rapha means to heal, restore, cure, mend, or repair. So Jehovah Rapha, this almighty one and only God who in the narrow, in the narrow scope of his character is the God who heals, mends, fixes broken things, cures, and cares for. And anytime, yeah, I think that's exciting. Anytime we see something like that in the word of God, what God's saying is, this is who I am for you corporately, and it's also who I am for you individually. He is the God who heals you. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's the God who heals you as a church, us as a body of believers, but he's also the God who heals you individually. And we're gonna take a pretty narrow look at this and, and get into, into the specifics about what this name really means. I also mentioned that all of these names come from stories in the Old Testament. And last week we looked at Abraham and Isaac, uh, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provided at the last minute um, way before Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac. And I told you last week, this, there's always a story in the Old Testament beneath the story. And the story beneath the story in the Old Testament is always the story of Jesus. So last week I told you that it was never about Abraham killing Isaac. It was about Abraham killing idolatry within himself because he had made Isaac an idol. Today, we're looking at the same thing, not the same story, but I want to give you context on Exodus 15. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, uh, the, the, the scripture that Gabby just read a minute ago. But kind of giving you context, here's what's going on. The story that I'm reading from today, very few people know anything about it because it's this small story, obscure story, tucked between gigantic popular stories. So right before this happens, the Israelites are released from Egypt, from captivity in Egypt, and they are moving through the Red Sea. God does this massive Red Sea miracle, which I, I preached on in January. And they get through the Red Sea. They're walking on dry ground. So when they're coming up to the Red Sea, I would say that's a gigantic water problem. There's a problem in front of them, and it has to do with water. And God solves the water problem for them. Would you agree? I'm going somewhere with this. Yes? Okay, so then we get through the Red Sea, that water problem solved. But the moment they get through the Red Sea, now they're getting into the wilderness, which is a very dry, hot wilderness, and they need water. So for three days, they don't have any water, and they start complaining to Moses. This is the first recorded time where post-Red Sea, the Israelites start their complaining and grumbling to Moses and God about their condition. And isn't it just like humanity? to forget within the span of three days they have a new water problem and they had already forgotten that God solved their last water problem. They need water to drink and after three days they find themselves at this pool, this little body of water that would later be named Mara because of this story. They come up to this body of water, this little pool of water, and they're so excited after three days, they're complaining, and finally there's water, and they, they reach into the water, and they begin to drink it, and it's bitter, they can't, it's undrinkable, it's dirty, and they can't drink the water. If I, I don't know about you, but if I was them, I would be thinking, God, we get through the Red Sea, and we're asking for water? Why in the world are you playing with us? 
Why, if we needed water, why would you bring us to water that was bitter? And some of us, we know exactly what they're talking about. Some of us maybe have stories of, God, I'm lonely. I need someone. I, I need a relationship. I want to be married. And just like God, right, brings you through the Red Sea, and all of a sudden, there's the relationship, and then you find out it's bitter. <laughs> this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This is bitter. I, I, this is, this is oh God, why are you doing this to me? Why? I ask, you know, we, we have all kinds of situations like this, and that's what God is doing with the Israelites, And oftentimes we think God is doing something to them, but really it's God doing something with them and for them. So when we look at this story, then they are complaining and and God tells Moses, after after Moses cries out to God, take this tree, he points at a tree, take this tree and throw it into the bitter waters of Marah. Marah means bitter, by the way. Throw it into the bitter waters of Marah and watch what happens. They throw it in and the waters turn sweet and drinkable And then they are cheering and saying, thank you, God, for bringing us water. And it is the story of the people of God doing this all through the next 40 years of the wilderness on their way to the promised land. In this story, though, at the very end, God introduces himself as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And it's interesting, to be honest with you, it's interesting that God would introduce himself as the healer in this story where there's really no physical healing to be found. I'm gonna be honest, like I I probably could have pointed at some different stories that would have said, God, that would have been a great story over there where the paralyzed person started walking and said, I am Jehovah Rapha. But why is he introducing himself as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals in a story where he turns water from bitter into drinkable? I want us to look at three points today if you're taking notes. And we're gonna look at this. Jehovah Rapha has the power to heal us, number one, Physically, we're gonna look at the three ways Jehovah Rapha heals us. Jehovah Rapha has the power to heal us, number one, physically. In the story, it does say in Exodus 15, 26, this is where he introduces himself officially, I am Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals you. The God who heals you. Now we know, we know, based on other stories in scripture, that God doesn't just heal waters, he heals people. He's the God who heals physical bodies. He's the God who mends things. He is the God who heals. But in this story, specifically what he's doing, because God right now, post Red Sea, is for the first time establishing the nation of Israel. He is establishing his people, the nation of Israel, who in the New Testament, that nation, God's people, God's people becomes the church. He's establishing who he is. So he's saying, I am the healer of waters, but I am declaring who I will forever be, Jehovah Rapha, the healer of everything. I can heal water, I can heal bodies, I can heal minds. And in the story, we see there's so many things that point into the future, like all other stories in the Old Testament. What he's pointing to and what he's wanting them to remember is for the next 40 years, they don't know it's gonna be 40 years yet, but for the next 40 years, you need to remember in the wilderness that I'm Jehovah Rapha. In the promised land, you're going to need to remember this story where I introduce myself to you and remember I am the healer, Jehovah Rapha. And you go all through the Old Testament and God reveals himself to his people as this physical healer of bodies and minds. And it goes all the way into the New Testament with the story of Jesus. Matthew 4, 23 says this about Jesus. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Jesus is God. Jesus is Jehovah Rapha incarnate. We see the story of Jesus and his compassion for people. Everywhere he went in his ministry, he's healing people. He's he's mending minds and bodies, and and he's raising dead people uh, back to life, and he's, uh, he's healing people who are paralyzed, and they're walking again. And all of this was prophesied in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was pierced, talking about Jesus, prophesying for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him, and this line is so important in our doctrine and our belief as Christians today, and by his wounds we are healed. 
That was a prophetic statement in the Old Testament that would come true when Jesus was beaten and he bled and went to the cross because of those wounds, because his body was broken, he mends our bodies. People have asked me before, do you really believe physical healing is still a part of our lives today? Can God really heal? I love how interactive you guys are today. This is great. You're like, yes, he is. And I, yes, he is a healer. I, I've seen it. And I, I've had people when we've prayed that got, were miraculously healed and then people we prayed for weren't. And what's so important for us to remember, and I will point to this toward the end of the message, we've got to remember this. Although sometimes people are healed physically in this life, the thing that is most important is a spiritual healing that is forever. Now, I want you to remember this because at best, all physical healing in this world is temporary because everyone one day will pass away in this life and enter into the next. So physical healing is important. God still does it today, but all physical healing is, is pointing to the greatest kind of healing, the spiritual healing that we can all experience in our soul, in our spirit, in our mind, and for eternity. I wanted them to throw up a slide on the screen. These are 30 scriptural examples, not all of the examples in the Bible, but 30 of them that talk about physical healing in scripture. If you wanna take a picture of this, you can. Um, I, I, would, I, I think it's fascinating to do a study on this kind of stuff. If you've ever wondered, what is physical healing? Is, does it work today? Where does it come from in the Bible? What is the source? These are great scriptures to look at and to do a scriptural study of it. And we have the biblical validity of it, but we also circumstantially see healings all the time in our church. I've grown up in church and I have seen healings where there is no possible explanation other than the power of God intervening in that moment. Mandy and I went to dinner with an amazing couple in our church uh, a few months ago, and this couple oversees all of the Alpha courses. They're volunteer ministry leaders in our church, Gus and Susan Grace. And Gus uh, told us uh, that he had experienced healing at one of our Alpha weekends. So I asked Gus Grace if he would join me on stage and help tell this story. But welcome, Gus Grace, up to the stage. Gus and Susan are two of my favorite people, and um, they've been leading our Alpha courses for four or five years now, right? Yes. And if you have not signed up for an Alpha course this summer yet, it is not too late, and you need to do it. It, it, it helps you um, be a lot more like Jesus. So there you go. That, that, that's, a great, that's a great reason, that's right? That's a great reason, yes. Um, but Gus, you, you, you were dealing with something for years physically, yeah. and this last spring at one of our Alpha weekends, you were healed. I want, us, I want you to tell us a little bit about what happened? Yeah, so on March 4th, Saturday, March 4th, I received a, a healing out of, out of the blue, except leading up to this, I spent 10 years with a bad shoulder. Uh, basically, I, I haven't had a, up until the time of the healing, I haven't had a good night's sleep for 10 years, maybe a couple, couple hours a night, had no range of motion, maybe my shoulder would go up this high. Couldn't move it very much. Worked on it through exercise, yoga, chiropractors, but just sort of trudged through it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had our Alpha Weekend where we learn about the Holy Spirit and how he acts. And um, I had asked for healing. I had asked for healing since 2018, every Alpha, every Alpha Weekend. And so we went outside to spend some time with the Lord and as I was walking back in, Tom Pullen, uh, who was attending the Alpha Weekend, said, hey, Gus, um, God asked me to heal or uh, pray for your shoulder. So I said, sure. Uh, so he laid his hands on my shoulder. Uh, his wife was behind laying her hands on my shoulder. And all of a sudden, my shoulder felt like somebody had literally like twisted it and pulled it out of the socket. And I looked up at Tom, and Tom's a towering guy compared to me. And I said, Tom, did you feel that? And he said, yes. And I said, I think I got healed. So we were dismissed back into the Alpha Conference where we we're gonna give our testimonies. And I went to the bathroom, not to use the bathroom, but to test my shoulder. So there's this big mirror and I started lifting my arm, turning my arm, doing this. <laughs> I was kind of going crazy in the bathroom awesome. and I was like, holy crap, I think I just got healed. <laughs> you know, I was like, so uh, that's, that's what happened. You. Then I went back into the session, and then I literally demonstrated to 60 people in that conference, like, God decided to heal me. Give God yeah. a hand clap. That is awesome. 
You know, when you were sharing the story with us, you had mentioned something I just think is kind of cool, just the faith of, of children. Tom has a granddaughter and, and kind of talked to him, told him something before Alpha Weekend about praying and share that with us too. I think yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, one of the things that came out, there were a couple of people saying, well, are you, are you sure you were healed 100% or completely? And then Tom had shared that he had just talked to his granddaughter a few days before about healing and his granddaughter said, Grandpa, just make sure you heal you pray for 100% healing. And so every time Tom and I see each other, I say, hey, 100%, so. It's, it, I know, it's cute, that's, that's cute. Uh, okay, so I, the reason why that's so cool, though, and why I lean on the faith of kids all the time is because to them, they're, they're, why not ask for 100%? Sometimes when we go to God for healing, we're like, God, I, I know you're the healer, but just do the bare minimum, you know? Like, I just, I don't, I feel weird asking for complete healing, but what's so awesome is knowing the nature of God, that he's Jehovah Rapha, yeah. we can go to him and say, God, heal us 100%. We can have faith for 100% healing, physically and, and mentally and emotionally, and I just think it's powerful. You had also shared uh, a story that you share at some of the Alpha Weekends about, the, you know, is that, I guess, one of the first Alphas maybe in, in England, but a story, a story of, of healing and, and that's really faith building for me too. Share that. Yeah, it, it really resonated with me, and I hope it resonates with you, because uh, I was really moved by the number of people who needed prayer the mm -hmm. last service. But I was trying to raise everybody's faith level, so I heard this story as a true story. It happened in 1981 in England. Um, the vicar of uh, the Anglican Church had invited John Wimber and his team from America to go teach them about the Holy Spirit. And so they had a gathering there and John Wimber says, hey, you English people, you're so boring. Bring all the young people up to pray for, <laughs> for these people. And there was a older lady in her, in her 80s named Esther. And Esther said, I need prayer for the cataracts in my right eye. I think I'm gonna be blind. And so one of the young men laid his hands on her. And all of a sudden she puts her hand over her right eye, and she's looking up and reading. She could read all the scriptures in the church. And John Wimber says, wait, we prayed for your right eye. And Esther said, I was blind in my left eye. I was afraid I was going blind in my right eye. And so God, there was a twist to the story that just resonated with me. And for some reason, I felt something was gonna happen that day because of that. That's amazing. I love stuff like that because I, the, the twist in the story too because it shows sometimes you're asking for something so small. It's the 100% healing thing. You know, I'm already blind in this side, but I don't wanna lose the side in this side. Let me pray for this. But then God says, why don't I just story, restore you completely? Yep. These stories are so important because they are faith building. We, we, you know, we know it's not, it's not good theology to say healing completely depends on your faith. But what is good theology is to say faith is a part of the equation. Because it is. The Bible says to bring what we can bring and let God do what we cannot do. It, we are not, our faith does not control God, but our faith lays the groundwork for God to do miracles. And these are the kinds of stories that build our faith. Can you give Gus another huge round of applause? Thank you so much, Gus, for being open and sharing that story. Um, I, I love this simple verse from the book of Psalms, Psalm 41.3. It says this. The Lord sustains him on his sickbed. In his illness, you restore him to what? Full 100% health. This is the God that we serve. He is Jehovah Rapha, and we can go to him. And what's awesome is at the end of the service today, we've shortened everything, including my message. And man, lucky for you. Um, and what we're gonna do is provide about 10 minutes at the end of service to invite you forward with our prayer team and staff to believe for physical healings today. Our 8.30 service was powerful, and we're believing for the same thing today. So not only is Jehovah Rapha, not only does he have the power to heal us physically, but also, number two, he has the power to heal us mentally and emotionally, mentally and emotionally. Now, when we look at this story in context, it does point to physical healing because he's Jehovah Rapha and all of it is encompassed underneath that name. But he introduces himself as Rapha in this story mainly for the purpose of the next two points, the type of healing that comes with mental and emotional healing. Exodus 15, 22 through 24 says this. They traveled for three days in the desert, but found no water. 
they came to Mara, where there was water, but they could not drink it because it was too bitter. The people grumbled to Moses and asked, what will we drink? So again, God brings them to this place, brings them to this place to discover something before they keep moving in their journey to go to the promise that he has for them. They look into the waters of bitterness and what God is trying to get them to realize is as they look into the waters of bitterness, he's trying to get them to see how bitter they had become. It was a reflection. I don't know about you, but I have a love-hate relationship with mirrors. Anybody else? I love them in the sense of what would we look like without them, number one, right? I, I, I'm grateful that we can look into a mirror. Most of you did this morning. All of you did. You guys, you guys look great. All of you. 8.30 service, not so much. All, I'm joking. All, all of you guys looked into a mirror this morning. So we love it because we have the opportunity to get ready. But I hate mirrors. Love, hate. I hate mirrors because I actually have to see what I actually look like. Because what I look like in my head is not what I look like when I look in a mirror. Anybody else? When I look in a mirror, I go, I am literally 10 years older than what's in my head. I need to go to therapy because I have to have more self-awareness because I look into that mirror and I go, what happened to me, right? Because it's a love-hate relationship. But one thing a mirror always does is tells you the truth. When you look into that mirror, when you see the thing looking back at you, that's you. That is you. And we have to come to terms with it. And what God was doing in this story is before they could ever go to the promise he had for them, he had to take them to the waters of Mara. As they look into the waters of bitterness, he was causing them to see the reflection of who they had become in Egypt. And what he was telling them is, until I heal you of the bitterness you see in these waters, you cannot go into the promise I have for you forever. There are too many believers that have a genuine promise from God in their future, but God cannot allow them to move into the promise because they are infected with a disease in the wilderness and he cannot allow the disease of bitterness to go into the promise. Too many believers never get to where they're going, ever, because they haven't allowed Jehovah Rapha to heal them of their emotions and their minds. Is God bringing you to the pool of reflection today to look into your own spirit and ask the question, do I have something in my spirit, in my mind, and in my emotions that I am holding on to, even with complete justification, according to you, that I'm not willing to let go of that is causing me to be bitter? From my experience in ministry and meeting with hundreds and thousands of people over the years, it is bitterness I believe that causes the, the sin that causes the most destruction in people's lives. It can split us internally. It splits marriages. It splits families, groups in church. Bitterness can split entire churches and bitterness can split the body of Christ. God is calling us to look into the mirror. And I believe today there are people who walked in holding on to something that can be healed today. And by the time you leave, you can release it and live in freedom and walk into the promise that God has for you. Do you believe that today? <laughs> Hebrews 12, 15 says this about bitterness. Watch over, each, watch over each other to make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace. That's important. And make sure no one lives with a root of bitterness sprouting within them, which will only cause trouble and poison the hearts of many. I had a, a pastor friend ask me the other day, what do you think one of the main jobs, what are some of the main jobs of a pastor shepherd in a congregation? And I said, there's multiple, but one of the main jobs of every pastor is to look out for roots of bitterness because it poisons many. Helping people that have bitterness, not coming in going, you don't belong here, but helping people with bitterness and leading them to the pools of Mara to look into the reflection to say, hey, there's something going on internally that you can have freedom if we would stop doing this all the time and just one time do this, how much freedom and healing can Jehovah Rapha give us if we will just let him be the eternal righteous judge of what people have done to us? Oftentimes when we are bitter at people, we end up being bitter at God. 
and God's saying today is the day to deal with it. God's not saying get over it. God's saying give it to me. Give it to God and watch the healing. There are people today that need healing from broken relationships, healing in depression and anxiety. You're at your end. You need healing in your mind, healing in your emotions. I said Rafa means the the mender of broken hearts. There are people in the room today that have broken hearts from broken marriages and broken relationships, broken relationships with their own children and grandchildren. We're finding ourselves lonely and Jehovah Rafa is the healer of anything broken. But he's looking and asking you today, do you have bitterness? Do you have something on the inside of you? He has, I believe, brought you to the pools of Mara today to look into the reflection and see what's really there. I came across a story years ago when I was in Bible college that was so convicting to me and and encouraging at the same time. I wanted to share it with you and show you a little video. But there was a woman who lived, um, she she actually died, I believe, in, in the 1970s or 80s, but she was alive during World War II and her family became famous because of events that happened there. Her name was Corrie ten Boom. Many of you might be familiar with her. Her and her family were Dutch Christians um, during World War II. They lived in the Netherlands, uh, specifically the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. And when they found out what Nazis were doing to the Jews, they opened up their home in secret to be a hiding place. And she would later write a book called The Hiding Place, highly recommended if you've never read that book, and about her story. But her and her family, her parents and her siblings, opened up their house in secret to hide Jews. Over the years of World War II, it is estimated that they saved over 800 Jewish people because of their commitment to what they did in their own home. In 1944, though, a Nazi informant found out what they were doing, and their entire family got arrested. They were either thrown into prisons or concentration camps, and within just a few months, her entire family died, her parents, her siblings, and she was the only one alive, and she made it through the concentration camp. And later on the other side of it opened up and talked about how she dealt with the bitterness and unforgiveness and pain within her and how she dealt with it. She traveled to 60, over 60 different countries sharing the gospel and how to overcome and how to be healed of internal bitterness. And it was an incredible story. And I want you to take a look at just this couple minute clip. It was some time ago that I was in Berlin and there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Bohm, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel aufseers, guards, in the concentra- in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian. I have found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world. Also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done. But then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Tambom wants him here forgiven. Will you forgive me? And I could not. When I was in the concentration camp, one of the most terrible things I had to go through was that they stripped us of all our clothing. And we had to stand naked. The first time was the worst. I said, Betsy, I cannot bear this. And suddenly it was as if I saw Jesus at the cross. And the Bible tells, they took his garments. He hanged there naked. And I knew he hanged there for me, for my sins. And by my suffering, I understood a fraction of the suffering of Jesus Christ. And it made me so thankful that I could bear my suffering. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But when I saw 
When I explained that I could not forgive, suddenly I knew I myself have no forgiveness. Do you know that Jesus has said that? When you do not forgive those who have sinned against you, my heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. I, I knew, oh, I'm not ready for Jesus coming because I have no forgiveness for my sins. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these beautiful texts, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment, I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. That story moved me so much, and I wanted to share it with you today if you hadn't heard it, because he is Jehovah Rapha, the one who can heal us internally for all of the things we carry. And lastly today, Jehovah Rapha has the power to heal us spiritually. He heals us physically, mentally, emotionally, and thirdly, spiritually. The Israelites in Exodus 15 were physically thirsty. But remember what I told you last week, what so often in the Old Testament looks like a story just about physical circumstances. A layer deeper is a prophetic, spiritual, eternal message that points to Jesus and the New Testament. And I mentioned one of the reasons I love the Bible so much is it's not just a compilation of different books. It, there, it is a series of books that is threaded together by the power of the Holy Spirit so intricately and perfectly pointing to each other in cross-references, and it's amazing. I'll show you. So in Exodus 15, they're physically thirsty. In John chapter four, Jesus, pointing to Jesus, he finds himself in a conversation with a Samaritan woman at a well. They're physically thirsty. And he tells her he is about more than just satisfying physical thirst. He can ultimately and finally satisfy the spiritual thirst, the thing we long for the most. It says in John 4, 14, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again, but the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water, satisfying his thirst for God, welling up, continually flowing, bubbling within him to eternal life. Jesus is saying every person thirsts. What was thirsting for the physical in the Old Testament is pointing to the greatest thing we thirst for, which is ultimate fulfillment in eternity and in this life, and it can only come from God. Also in that story, they found themselves at the pool of Mara, the waters of Mara, the bitter waters. It is no accident that in the New Testament, when Jesus was talking with his disciples, and they're all pining for position in Matthew, um, in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus looks at them and tells them, you can't handle the cup of bitter water, the bitter cup that I have to carry. He says, but Jesus answered them saying, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? They had no idea then, and the, the Israelites had no idea back in the Old Testament that there was something greater happening. Jesus is telling us that the reflection in Exodus 15, that the bitter waters were a reflection of who they were spiritually. And Jesus is saying, I'm taking on the bitter cup of responsibility to take care of mankind's greatest problem. Then in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, starting in verse 38, it says, then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved so that I am almost dying of sorrow. Stay here and stay awake and keep watch with me. And after going a little further, Jesus fell face down and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, 
but as you will. That cup of bitterness he referenced in Matthew 20, Jesus is carrying with him and it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. I also think it's interesting that in Exodus 15, are you guys with me so far? In Exodus 15, what did God tell Moses to do about the problem? It says that God showed Moses a tree and Moses had to take the tree and throw it into the waters of bitterness. And once he did, the waters of bitterness turned into sweet water that they could drink. That word for tree in the Old Testament is used two other times in scripture. One of those times it's used is in the New Testament. It says this in 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the what? Tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, but by his wounds you have been healed. The same exact word. God tells Moses in the Old Testament, take that tree and throw it into the waters of bitterness. It's a reflection of their own sin. And that tree will take care of the sin that they have in Exodus 15. But in the New Testament, Jesus carries a tree. And when he goes to that hill, Golgotha, when he is hung on what Peter calls the tree, when that tree goes into the sea of sin and bitterness, the grace of the tree goes in with it and turns our sin into grace if we call on the name of the one who hung on that tree. Fascinating. The only other time that word tree is used, that exact word is in Revelation chapter 20, pointing to the tree of life. And the tree of life symbolizes Jesus because it gives all forgiveness and all life. What's true in the Old Testament points to ultimate truth in the New Testament. And I wanna encourage you today, you might need a circumstantial healing today and God welcomes the request because he is Jehovah Rapha, your healer physically and your healer emotionally and physically. But the greatest form of healing we could ever have is the healing of where Jesus Christ comes into our lives and the bitter sin in our lives that separates us from God when what he did on that cross enters this sea of bitterness, it transforms it into the sweet waters of grace in our own hearts. And we are transformed from the inside out. And the Bible says all we have to do is call on the name of Jesus, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and we will be saved. We're gonna end our service a little bit differently today like I told you. And if you notice, we're well ahead on time. So what I'm gonna ask is for everyone to stand and for no one to leave unless it's an emergency. This is still considered the church service. I'm not doing closing announcements. We don't need to rush out. This is a moment that this entire service points toward. I know there's a schedule, but we're gonna sing one song. This song is called Your Nature, and it fits so perfectly into this story because it's the nature of God and what he wants to do in our lives and heal us and transform us. Our prayer team is going to come to the front. They can start making their way down right now, and our staff. And what we wanna do is we wanna be able to pray for you. If you're in here today and you need healing physically, in a moment, I want you to come. If you're in here today and you need healing mentally and emotionally, it could be something with mental health. It could be something with unforgiveness. It could be something with just something in your spirit. You need a transformation, a cleansing, and healing from Jehovah Rapha. Or if you're in here today and you need the ultimate healing, reconciliation with God through Jesus Christ as our Savior, and you want spiritual healing today, then we would love for you to come down and join us. In our 8.30 service, we had a powerful time of prayer and we want you today, even if, even if you're like, I don't know if I have time, you have time. We will stay and pray for you. This is what the Bible tells us to do. I'm gonna read this scripture, I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna, we're gonna start singing this song. James 5, 14 through 15 says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. We hang on the words of God. Faith in the room is high, and we believe physical healings can happen today, emotional healing, mental healing, and spiritual healing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. And God, I pray in just a moment that, that people in boldness would step out and come down and pray to receive this healing. You've brought us to the waters of Mara today for a reason, to see the reflection of what we really need. And there are people in this room who are in desperate need of what only you can offer, Jehovah Rapha. 
We welcome you here today. We know your Holy Spirit is here and we are gonna lean into your spirit and understand and believe for healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can